Hello and welcome to the Alpha Movement Podcast. My name is Tom Foxley and on today's show I'm joined for a part two with Dr. Andy Galpin. Now Dr. Andy Galpin, or Andy as I'm going to call him from now on for uh, brevity's sake, it was kind enough to suggest that Jimmy Bagley came on the show, Dr. Jimmy Bagley I should say, um, and let's be let's be honest these guys are incredibly bright and incredibly good at what they do and um, without these kind of guys we wouldn't be able to have the kind of insight into physiology and training that we do so please do me the favor of listening in but if you want show notes and a unique download basically the three steps to muscle growth that you guys need um, you can head over to alphamovement.co slash muscle that's alphamovement.co slash muscle and you shall find a free cheat sheet there and um, all the show notes that you could ever wish for. Now, let's get on with the show. So, welcome to the show, Andy and Jimmy. How are you doing, guys? Great. Thanks for having us, Tom. Fantastic. Great to be back. Cool. So, I think what we should do first is, um, is Jimmy say hello, just so we can do voices. All right. So, I'm Jimmy. Okay. And Andy, go. I'm Andy. <laughs> Excellent. So, Andy, we've got a a brief background of, of you and your kind of your bio until now. But Jimmy, we don't have anything on on record anyway. Um, so, why don't you give us a quick introduction to who you are and what you do? Sure, sure. So, I'm an assistant professor at San Francisco State University, um, California. Uh, I've been here for about a year, so I'm a new assistant professor. Um, I just started uh, a new lab called the Muscle Physiology Lab, and we're working pretty tight with Andy's group down in Southern California, um, just doing a lot of research on muscle physiology, human physiology, all, all real human stuff. So it's kind of where we're at. I teach muscle mechanics to grad students and undergrads, and I teach exercise physiology to undergrads as well. Nice. So when Andy and I left off last time, we'd been talking about um, a study with some twins that you had. Um, and I think, Jimmy, are you the best person to speak to about that study? Uh, yeah, parts of it. I can kind of give you a, a background about how it started, if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so um, it was kind of funny. I was After I finished my PhD, I was working in Andy's lab. He was nice enough to uh, take in an unemployed PhD uh, for a couple yeah, of months. Yeah, how nice do I have to be? I'm not going to pay you. You want to come to work in my lab? But <laughs> I'm the nice one here. Hey, it's paying dividends now with the publications. But um, anyway, so I was in the lab with one of his grad students, and we were just talking, and, uh, and she was uh, mentioning her dad was a twin. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. You know, what does he do? Oh, he's an elite um, Ironman triathlete. It's like, oh, that's really interesting. What does his twin brother do? And his turns out his twin brother did like absolutely no exercise for the past 35 years. So here we had like a case study where we had one person that had exercised their entire life and his pretty much identical clone had not done much of anything for 35 years. So what we did, we brought them into the lab and we did a battery of tests, like 20 or 30 tests, everything from muscle biopsies to uh, you know, VO2 max, all kinds of stuff, just to figure out the difference between these guys and what exercise really does for physiology. And so we just finished data collection, now we're analyzing, and we're getting some pretty interesting results. So what kind of results are we looking at? What's the, what's the big takeaways? Uh, exercise is good for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of one of the takeaways. Um, yeah, so obviously this guy was an endurance athlete, so he had pretty high aerobic capacity, right? Like much higher than the average average uh, average Joe out there, but he actually wasn't that strong. Um, so, you know, we saw that maybe just doing straight endurance exercise, not the best for muscle strength, obviously, as you'd kind of think. But um, right now we're teasing apart his fiber type to try to figure out what their fiber type differences are. We should get that data, Andy, any time now. Yesterday, actually, we got Yesterday. it. Well, maybe you could speak about that more then. I, I can't because we haven't uh, got the other twins yet. Mm. So, um, <clears throat> Jimmy, what you'll you'll know this very well that uh, we got the untrains back yesterday and it was ex almost exactly like we would predict, which is a lot of what we call Tom uh, hybrid fibers. Yeah. These are muscle fibers that are actually co-expressing multiple types in one single cell. So it's kind of a fancy way of saying an individual muscle cell or muscle fiber is both fast and slow twitch. And what we typically see is the more untrained you get, the more of those fibers uh, you have around. And so th this lined up perfectly well. Now, what's going to be very interesting is what the train twin looks like. And we can't move forward with that until Jimmy gets his ass back down here because we need him for a couple of things. Um, <laughs> but what's actually, I think the interesting part about that, Tom, is, you know, so none of, nothing that we shared with you so far is really surprising. 
Mm. But what we're trying to do, and, and we do have some surprising stuff um, that we can't reveal quite yet. Um, but the, I think what's interesting is, is we know, you know, like Jimmy said, exercise is good. We know VO2 max is going to go up. We know that uh, a lot of health markers will improve if you exercise your, your entire life. But what we don't know are things like what's the magnitude. So how much can you improve? 3%, 20%, 80%. Um, what's, and, and there's no way we could say that because we could never control for genetics. So this is one of the few times when we've, ever, when we've been able to say, look, um, we know genetics and we know training play important roles in, in all of your physiology and all of your function, but we don't know exactly how much each plays. Well, now we have a number. Um, and it is a case study. It's only one, so it is limited. But we can literally say um, if, tr- if untrained twin is, has a score of 100, I'm just making up 100, mm. trained twin has a score of 180, well, then we know it, it is physiologically possible, and it might take three decades, but you can almost double your number here, whatever that number is, or cut it in half or, or, or whatever. So I think that's what's going to be really interesting um, is to tease out is what's the magnitude of change, and fiber type is a good example of that. I mean, we know, and Jimmy published a nice review paper a couple of years ago on the topic um, in an in a astronaut space flight sort of journal, but we know that you can change your fiber type with physical activity. We've known that for a long time but we never necessarily knew how much um, this is going to give us an indication of, of how much exactly plasticity you have in something like fiber type. So I'm assuming it will show a huge change in mitochondrial density as well. Yeah, probably if we were to measure that, that's kind of on <laughs> our radar too, to, to go after eventually um, kind of brings us, we're, look, we're looking at some imaging stuff with the muscle cells themselves. So I, I can kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so basically, you know, we tease out individual fibers down in Andy's lab to look at fiber type, right? Um, so these muscle cells are smaller than a human hair. We have to do it under a microscope, but we can also take those fibers out and um, lay them on a microscope slide and actually stain them with, you know, various dyes to look at organelles like mitochondria. So we can actually look at the number and volume of mitochondria. Also, what we're pretty interested in is looking at the nuclei. So, you know, muscle cells have multiple nuclei. If you remember, everybody remembers back to basic biology, a cell has a bunch of organelles, right? And the nucleus is right in the middle. It usually looks like a nice picture. But in real life, you know, the nucleus could be anywhere. In muscle cells, there's hundreds or thousands of nuclei. And those are what control things like hypertrophy, atrophy, uh, fiber type shifts, things like that. So we're able to actually look at those. And that's kind of going to be a big part of the next couple months when I get down there is to image these cells and look for those. And we can, if you go to Andy's website uh, for his lab, there's some nice pictures of some actually what the muscle fibers look like. It's really cool. Yeah. And yeah. jump in right there. Um, what's, you know, Jimmy kind of went over it pretty quickly there. Um, but what people don't really understand, if you walked into a biology apartment and you said, Hey, we found a cell that had more than one nuclei, like everyone with PhDs in biology would be like, what? No, unbelievable. And yet humans, we know that we have that, and we have thousands. So I, I think uh, Jimmy can speak the accuracy of this, but uh, I think you said one time that human skeletal muscle fibers are the biggest cells in all of biology by volume. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's yeah. crazy. That's how unique humans are, is our muscle fiber cells are the biggest cells you will find in the entire biological world. And we're one of the very, very few cells that have, you know, not only multiple nuclei per one, but thousands. So it makes it really, really interesting to study this stuff because – it's really crazy. Um, you know, why is it that some person recovers better from damage than another one? Why does one respond more to one type of training than another one? Why, um, questions Jimmy's brought up before, why is it that after you get into shape one time, it's easier to get back into shape than it was the first time? Um, we think a lot of this is regulated by this nuclear stuff. So I think it's really interesting stuff. And we're one of the few people that can really get after it, um, especially in humans. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. So something that I find interesting is um, just this is purely for my own interest. Um, what's the process like in going from um, you've got whoever you're studying there or whatever you're going, studying there. Let's use the twins example to a final result. What's the because obviously it's, it's not as simple as most people would imagine. <sighs> no. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Like the whole process. So you start with concept, right? I'm talking to a grad student. We come up with a study with her dad and her uncle, right? So that's kind of like the start of it. Um, and then you have to go through a whole process of paperwork, institutional review boards, the IRB, right? This is like our ethics board. You have to get everything you're going to do passed through that first. So that's a hurdle. You know, that takes a couple months. 
um, after you've designed the study, you've gone through IRB, then you start recruiting the participants, bring them into the lab, do all the data collection that you're going to do. And then that's when actually the real fun starts. What we're doing now is analysis, right? So now we're teasing out all the individual fibers, which takes hours, days, running them um, with different assays and stuff. And then after that, after you have the, that, then you get to do statistics, right? And then you can write up the paper. So all in all, one study could take years. Usually, yeah. Yeah, usually yeah. years. You're not going to start a study and then end of the semester or whatever, you're going to finish it. That's not, that doesn't happen. Uh, yeah, to, to um, piggyback on that, you know, it's, this is actually something I've picked up um, from the entrepreneur space, the business space, that they say these types of phrases a lot where um, it's sort of like, okay, one thing that makes someone very, very effective or productive is if they can find someone that they can work with is very complementary to their skill set. So in the entrepreneur world, it would be something like, okay, you take someone who's very creative and then you match them with someone who's a finisher, you know, this type of stuff. Mm. Um, well, it's a similar thing here where I would love to be able to tell you that, hey, you know, Jimmy and I meet once a quarter and we sit down on a board and sketch out all of our ideas of what we're going to, like, that's just, that's it. No way does it happen like that. It's mostly over beers or it's, you know, like at the end of a workout or in the middle of the shower and then you get these crazy ideas. And for me, I'm generally heavy towards the idea side. You know, I, I get a lot of ideas. I'm not necessarily a finisher. Um, Jimmy is an idea guy too, but a massive finisher. So we work mm. really well like that. Uh, he's a much better, much faster writer than I am, um, which is also... Uh, I don't know about that. Well, <laughs> I've been pretty slow lately, but... <laughs> well, when you have time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of funny because like, I'll get these things, and Jimmy, you probably get them too, where I get someone I don't know that emails me or tweets me or something like, Hey, I got this idea for a study you should do. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> An idea is the last thing a creative needs. I, found yeah. I got a board full of ideas that I'll never get to. What I need is time and someone to, to finish this damn thing. That's what yeah. I need. The um, ideas are interesting though. I mean, it's good for students to think up ideas and come up with stuff, but then you're like, Oh, that already was done in 1985 or whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. Or that would take seven years and $12 million. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so that's the fun part, you know, like all of us sort of agree the idea is a fun part. Even honestly, data collection is fun. I mean, you're usually, someone's working in our space, they're working their ass off to do some maximal effort exercise or we're taking biopsies, we're drawing blood. Like, and even the analysis can be fun, but what's, what's really hard is the end. And you have these spreadsheets yeah. and databases with hundreds of numbers and you're trying to come up with something that makes some semblance of sense because you know, science doesn't work like, oh, you measure this one thing, here's your result, there's your answer. Like, that's yeah. not how it works. It's, you got a multitude and think this one's up and this one's down, but this one went this way, this one didn't change, and you're trying to come up with some sort of story out of that, and that's usually where projects sort of die. You're like, yeah, we were super excited about that, and then, um, oh boy, I <laughs> just don't want to go back into that, and you know, we'll do this all the time. Jimmy and I will we'll take two, three months off from a project, and it takes two, three days or a week to get your head back into what's going on. Yeah. And then yeah, you sit down before you restart and you're like, oh man, do I really want to, and you get that blank look at your computer and you're like, oh my, yeah, you know, I'll, 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 I'll check my Twitter. And you're just like, you find something else. Yeah. I think that's, that's right, yeah. it's like so parallel with, with so many different areas as well. Like the, yeah. it's easy to start something and then it gets really fucking tough. Like whatever, whether it's building a business, whether it's changing your body, like whatever it's, uh, it gets yeah. tough at the end. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. fun in the very, very beginning, but finishing it is so yeah. hard. And that's what <clears throat> that's what'll drag it out a lot is yeah. is yeah, definitely. we just put a paper in this week that, that we started, I don't know, three years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had data analysis finished a year maybe ago, maybe more. I don't know. Yeah. I think we started in two thousand fourteen, the beginning, so yeah, it's been almost three years. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's impressive. It took a year to write it or more. Yeah. So last time we spoke, Andy, we were talking about, or we touched on hyperplasia and the idea of it. Um, could you give us a, a kind of a brief recap of it and like what your, what your thoughts are on it now? Yeah, awesome. <laughs> so well, hyperplasia is essentially a term for when you grow new muscle cells. So whenever your muscle gets bigger, so say you go to the gym, you do a bunch of squats, your quad gets bigger five weeks later. Not talking about like five seconds after your workout of that night. You know, you've gained muscle mass. Well, that can only really happen uh, from two ways. Number one, each individual muscle fiber got thicker, increased its diameter. That's called hypertrophy. Or you can add new muscle fibers. That would be hyperplasia. 
So even still to this day, it is essentially taught and told that hyperplasia, so the adding of new muscle cells is impossible or doesn't happen in humans. Uh, but I have been, since I was probably like 18 years old, a staunch advocate for hyperplasia. I'm totally on the hyperplasia brain, brain, uh, <laughs> board with that one. Um, so that's my brief overview. Nice. And then um, what are the kind of the, the troubles with, with uh, proving hyperplasia? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> I'll, I'll go a little more detail then. Um, first of all, we know that the body is extremely, what we'll say, plastic. Uh, which means it's very pliable, uh, very adjustable, manipulable. It, it'll move with a lot of different things. It's adapting constantly. I had a student ask yesterday in class, you know, I heard that your body changes every five to seven years. Is that true? And I said, no, it's changing every five to second milliseconds. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is constantly moving. Um, where it is. So uh, we know that you can grow new cells in basically every type of cell type you have in your body. And for some reason, we think that muscle doesn't do that. Uh, and so for me, the burden of proof has to be on. You got to show me it doesn't because it seems much more logical for it to grow. And that's all based on early work um, in probably Jimmy's 70s, 60s, something like that. Um, as far as hyperplasia? Yeah, with the cats and the animals. Yeah, yeah, that was the 60s, uh, early 60s, where they did the cat model. But in that model, they were you know, actually able to remove limbs and count the fibers one by one, whereas we can't do that in humans. <laughs> yeah, so to answer your question, Tom, what we'd have to do is we'd have to, t and this is what they did uh, with those cats, is they cut off one leg, count all the fibers on your leg. Now, you got to remember, Jimmy told you earlier, the size of your individual fibers are less than the size of your hair, so... You can imagine sticking all those into a quadricep and you imagine counting, I don't know, millions of fibers in a, in a muscle. Oh, yeah. No. So in humans, it's impossible. Even in a cat, that's, that's ridiculously difficult. And then what we'd have to do is we'd have to say, okay, you've got a million fibers in this right leg. Well, then let's put your left leg through 12 weeks of training or 12 years or 12 days or whatever it is. And we've got to cut that leg off and count all the fibers. That's the only way we would really be able to verify that there's more fibers in that one side as, as a result of training. Now, we know that you go through hyperplasia when you're developing, um, you know, as a, as a very young kid, I don't know what age you have your fiber numbers set. Do you have an idea, Jimmy? Probably up to pu past puberty up to, you know, end of growth, whenever that is yeah, early so adulthood, probably still adding cells at that point. But after that, into late adulthood, you're, you're pretty much set in thought anyways. And so, you know, the problem with it is uh, one, how are we logistically feasibly going to be able to do that. And then two, Tom, are you going to put your hand in to volunteer for that study? <laughs> you're not going to give up both your legs right? yeah they yeah, all do that <laughs> yeah, right? i love science but not that much so yeah i mean the best evidence for hyperplasia in humans came from i think 80s and early 90s and bodybuilders yeah so you know obviously bodybuilders have much bigger whole muscles than normal people that's the point right get your muscles as big as possible but um when they look under a microscope at the cells they weren't obviously able to count every cell but the cell sizes were either similar or even some cases smaller than normal humans. So if they have smaller cells, but bigger muscles, they must have much more cells, right? Um, whether or not they were born like that, or they grew those over time. And then that throws in the, you know, the equation of testosterone and, um, exogenous you know, testosterone, yeah, exogenous, right? Yep. Yeah. So steroid use. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the best we can do is, is we just look at those, those studies like that of looking at these groups compared to that group, that doesn't tell us, you know, was that a result of, or were they born like that? So that's our current limitation. And, uh, you know, some of the stuff that, that Jimmy has played around with a little bit, and I don't think we could say too much about this is, you know, there's potential we could come up with some equations to be able to calculate those numbers right now. Now they have a decent error factor. Um, and I don't know if they would get through review, uh, but we may be able to get to ourselves to a place where we can have an, a, a rough estimate. Um, and then maybe, you know, who knows with, 20 years of technology, maybe we'll be able to just take an ultrasound to your quad and count all the individual fibers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, something that kind of that comes to mind when you're talking about muscle growth is the pump, obviously. Yeah. And uh, the thing I was wondering is, is there any actual physiological benefit that only happens when your muscles are pumped and there is a lot of blood flow there? Or is it just simply a byproduct that doesn't have any kind of benefit? Well, it's tough to say. Um, I, I, to back up, I, so that we're speaking the same language here, what people generally refer to about the pump is when you literally, like you leave the gym or you're, you're just got done training and your muscle feels like it's pumped, right? That's what you're referring to? Yeah. Jammed up, right? Well, it feels great. 
Yeah. Best time to go to the beach. Yeah. yeah Friday yeah. night mission. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. So um, it, what we know happens is hypertrophy. There's several mechanisms that cause hypertrophy. Um, one of them is metabolic stress. So this is the burn, right? This is why the old adage of, you know, uh, no pain, no gain. This is, even though those things are not correct, and I can't remember if I mentioned this last time, but we know, for example, there's almost no relationship between the amount of, of DOMS that you have and the amount of growth you get. So in other words, if you crush yourself in the gym and, you know, someone tells you and you're absolutely shot and someone says, you know, one more rep, one more set, and you go another one, and then you do one more exercise and you're just crawling out of the gym you're probably not, and you're just, you know, wreck sore for two, three, four, five days. You're probably not getting any more growth than you are if you just stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you walk out of the gym feeling fresh and like, hey, I feel great right now, you probably didn't do enough work. And so it has to burn a little bit. There has to be some metabolic stress there, but that doesn't mean metabolic crippling, right? Yeah. So me metabolic stress is, is one thing, you know, the, the burn anyways. Um, mechanical tension is another. It's got to be at least fairly heavy um, and to, to cause some sort of mechanical stress need to happen. So the filaments that reach up and, and connect to each other and pull and cause the muscle to contract have to be stressed on some level uh, or I should say can be. And then the third one or uh, in addition to that is some sort of damage, right? And so again, people talk about this all the time. So if you look at all three of those categories, you don't have to have all three to have hypertrophy. You need to have at least one, probably best if you have a little combination of all three. So the pump is totally in that. If you're getting to a place where you're, you're pumping and you have more blood flow to an area and your, your bicep is swollen or your tricep or your you know, forearm or whatever it is, is pumped up, you've probably created at least metabolic stress to that area, which will probably result in some hypertrophy. It's, I would say, pseudo indicator, but... Um, reasonable enough um what's sort of funny because like I, you know the more i you know the old adage that people say you know the more you learn the more you realize that you're dipshit you know yeah <laughs> uh, i think the saying something like that anyways uh it's sort of funny when you go back and look at these things like this and these are all bodybuilding ideas from 50, from the 70s 60s and stuff and you realize you're like well the pump that's stupid you know whatever okay you don't know what you're talking about the the burn you don't know what you're talking about it's like well mm -hmm. damn it Okay, you had silly terms, but you kind of actually were on to something a little bit anyway. Got a burn, yeah. got a pump, or those help, um, which have, have opened up the door for things like blood flow restriction training, occlusion training, which have, you know, when that stuff came out, it really it honestly shocked the research world. You're like, you can induce massive hypertrophy when you train it with five pound curls and a 220 pound trained athlete? Yeah. So that's actually what, something I wanted to touch on. So, um, Jimmy, can you give us a bit of a, an understanding about what occlusion training is and like kind of the benefits of it? Sure, sure. That's a yeah, that's a good transition into that. So, occlusion training. Um, it's also called katsu training in Japan. It's been around for hundreds of years, if not more, probably. Uh, but it's basically where you right take a band and wrap it around either your upper arm or your leg or some part to occlude the the blood flow below that. And the idea is that you're able to lift at a lower intensity. So say you're used to lifting, you know, 70%, 10 reps or something like that. In this case, you would lift maybe 20 or 30% um, and potentially get similar benefits as, as lifting heavier. And the idea is because you're creating that metabolic stress and thereby occluding oxygen and, and not allowing byproducts to leave um, through the blood and things like that. So that's kind of the basic idea behind it. Um, and I think there is a lot of use for it, especially in people that uh, may potentially have, you know, injuries where they're unable to lift a heavy load. They may do some type of occlusion training so they can get or at least maintain what they've got. Um, nice. And that's in that case. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah, and Jack, can you go on that, Andy? Sorry. I was to say, I was just in um, uh, Houston not too long ago, uh, and I talked actually with some of the guys at NASA. Uh, and I was talking with one of the, I think he's the head strength conditioning coach at NASA. And he was saying that, and actually, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you this, especially foreigners. I don't know. Maybe this is <laughs> secrets. Yeah. <laughs> Trade. Wiki, WikiLeaks. I'm probably, the FBI is probably outside of my door right now. <laughs> um, but he was saying this is one of the things that they were exploring with the astronauts. Um, that's such a challenge with them. Of course, this is the, you know, probably the main limiting factor of us getting to Mars or anyone getting to Mars is the, the bone mineral density and muscle mass issue. So what he's saying is they're actually expo exploring um, taking these blood flow restriction devices up to space, but putting them actually well, they'll, they'll say cover the entire quad. 
instead of just being a tourniquet style like over your top of your muscle it would include big chunks of the muscle and this is sort of interesting because you and i have worked in, in this area for a decent amount of time where uh, there has been i don't know hundreds of millions of dollars spent in trying to figure out this muscle mass wasting issue with space right mm -hmm. the problem is if you watch the, the barbell shrugged full depth episode when they were down at nasa and it's really really complicated you can't just take a squat machine up there uh it, it's too heavy it in fact the biggest is you can't take things like bands either people have, have, have heard people say they're like well, why don't you just take heavy bands obviously they don't pay attention to lou simmons blah 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 I'm like I'm a dummy if you pull this way it pulls the ship that way yeah <laughs> you're gonna go off course that doesn't work um people have tried flywheels there's issue with that too and so i think this might be a really uh a really interesting thing that they can do that may it doesn't fix the problem. It never will. Um, but it could be really helpful uh, in terms of muscle specifically. You own, you got an issue with still, but uh, could be a home run in terms of muscle. Mm -hmm. okay. Nice. So um, something we talked about, or I was going to say something we talked about last time, something we talked about last time that no one else heard um, was concurrent exercise, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. So um, concurrent exercise being the idea that you can perform different types of different types of exercise so aerobic and strength training and get benefits from both um what were your kind of findings from from that right yeah so we published um me and my colleague kevin uh who's out in the university of kentucky we published a review article just came out in sports medicine journal um and what we found was we did a huge review of the literature cited over 100 papers um and found that with concurrent training, right, you're combining aerobic and resistance training. Most people thought, you know, since the 1980s that if you do that, you're automatically going to limit your strength gains. Mm. There's no way you can maintain your strength while continuously doing, you know, aerobic throughout. Um, and we found out that it's not necessarily true um, based on the review of literature that if you do space out your exercises, you know, six hours seems to be a good number. And you're also just maintaining or, um, watching how much volume you do too. So if you're not overtraining, spacing out exercise and maybe not running, maybe cycling or, or rowing or doing some other kind of exercise that's not necessarily high impact, um, that you can maintain or even gain strength um, while doing concurrent training. Okay, excellent. So my, my proof there would be um, the idea that, well, you just look at the CrossFit Games is, is very recent <laughs> and you just look at that and you, you've got the perfect example there, I think. Yeah, we can look at that from our side, too, of mixed martial arts. Uh, I mean, you name it. Uh, oh, yeah. These people, where people get caught up on this is a couple of things. Number one, you have to identify the true goal. So are you trying to just get, you know, I want to get stronger and I want to get more fit and I want to improve this? Then concurrent training is probably fine as long as J what Jimmy said. You, you don't do an hour and a half of lifting and then try to do a, a seven-mile run back-to-back, -back, right? Do you space yeah. it out? So maybe you lift in the morning, run at night, or vice versa, or every other day then it's probably okay. Or is your goal like trying to maximize hypertrophy? I mean, are you a fitness figure, competitor, bodybuilder, or are you trying to just get as jacked as possible for your wedding or spring break or whatever? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're doing that, then you maybe have a different answer. Uh, maybe the aerobic won't hurt you so much, but it probably will minimize someone or it will, it will cost you a few percentage points. And if you're in yeah. the last few percentage points, uh, a bunch of endurance training maybe won't be super helpful, but you also have to redefine, or actually I should say, define what the hell you mean when you say aerobic. Yeah. Does that mean you can't jog for a mile? Like, well, certainly if you jog a mile once a week, you're, it's not costing you anything for mm -hmm. the most part. Yeah. Um, does that mean 20 miles a week? You know, are you running? Are you cycling? Are you doing aerodyne? Like, all of these things play into factor. So I think Jimmy's paper was so good. In fact, I had like a two and a half hour lecture I did in my program design class every year. I had it recorded video series all up and i actually just had to take it down because i'm like damn it jimmy did it better in his paper <laughs> <laughs> and he did it in a 10 minute read um so i just use his paper now i'm like training for multiple goals here you go boom read this paper because it, it's very well um written in that words and it takes a lot of things into context um the answer is always it depends but it's understanding what parameters you're in uh, what are you talking in terms of how much endurance when is it happening how old are you uh, are you trying to gain weight? Are you trying to lose uh, body fat? Are you trying to stay where you're at? Um, mm -hmm. Those all you know, can pay. Uh, yeah, so. yeah. It, like you're saying, Andy, it's not like we're telling a shot putter to go run around the track and then go, you know, what, like they should not be running probably. But for the general public, a little cardio is not going to hurt. Exactly. Right? For the most part. Yeah. 
exactly so um i also wanted to kind of touch on what exactly kind of because we've what you're basically describing there is different energy systems using different energy systems at different times and whether it affects each other. So what kind of are the energy systems and um, what do we need to know about them? Well, you can kind of break it down into multiple ways. Typically in exercise physiology, we break it down into ATP PCR cycle, which is uh, phosphocreatine created to ATP pretty much. And that's going to be in the first five or 10 seconds of high intensity exercise. And then you've got kind of a glycolytic pathway, and then you've got more of an aerobic pathway. So if you remember glycolysis from way back in chemistry class, yes. that's mm-hmm. going to happen kind of midway for the first couple of minutes of exercise. And then after you've exercised for 5, 10 minutes, you're going to be using more fat, and so that's going to be more oxidative. So that's kind of like an easy way to break it down. Obviously, it's super complex, but um, yeah, and those are all working at the same time too. It's not like you switch from one to another to another. They're all continuously going. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the, oh, no, sorry. I was going to say, yeah, um, to add on to that, what I think people misunderstand is that those things are, they think that those are competing systems. Mm-hmm. They're absolutely not. One is directly feeding the other one. It's not like you have anaerobic over here fighting and battling aerobic or vice versa. Mm-hmm. Um, that if you're good at one, it's going to compromise the other. Uh, these things are complementary. So it's not only that they're running at the same time, the entire point of anaerobic system is to feed the aerobic system. It is a signaling mechanism to tell it, get going, this is what we need, here's what we need, resources. So um, that's a big misunderstanding with those environments. And, and if you look at something like lactate, it is a classic example of that. Lactate, lactate is a byproduct of anaerobic glycolysis. This is a fancy way of saying it is, a, it is only made when you go through anaerobic or uh, the break, the metabolization, metabolization? <laughs> the metabolism <Something> like that. <laughs> of sugar. Okay, so you're using sugar, it is create periods lactate as a byproduct but lactate directly signals aerobic system to sort of get going so it, it's not like it's fighting or it's, it's a problem or aerobic is here to fix anaerobic or anything like that it is its way of saying like hey the only way that you can talk to the aerobic system is to no not the only way that one way you can talk to it is to activate or start anaerobic and vice versa so <clears throat> it's a big misunderstanding with energy systems so i'll seamlessly transition into your thoughts on ketosis uh i'll I'll go ahead and jump off on this one first um so what i'll say is is first and foremost your body is meant to adapt and so i think that people have to be very careful when they do things like oh i cut this out of my diet or i started this way and i immediately felt better for two weeks or three weeks or something um because again, your body is meant to adapt. So sometimes what usually happens is week one or two, it's like a struggle, but then week three or four, you feel great. But oftentimes by week five, six, seven, eight, all of a sudden you're back to where you started in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, So variety is key. Variety in your training, variety in your food uh, is really, really key. So oftentimes when people make uh, big switches in their their diets, in this example, uh, you'll feel terrible for a couple of weeks. And then after that, you feel great. But then usually you come back to sort of baseline. Now, uh, those diets I think are really, really exciting for a couple of things. There's obviously a lot of research out showing some really impressive stuff with them. Um, It's not, it's nothing new. It's been around for quite some time, Um, but that doesn't mean there aren't massive limitations in it. For example, uh, there is a dearth of literature on what it does to females. So women in particular need to be very cautious. And that is not at all to say women shouldn't do it or that it can't work. But we all know now, especially with the new genetic testing that's becoming available in the new fields of nitrogenomics or nitrogenomics and nutrogenetics, um, it, it really depends on the, like what's your genetic background. So if you have uh, ancestry that is a different place, you might respond really well to a high fat diet. If your ancestries come from another place, you might not respond well to that diet because you don't have the genes, the proteins, the enzymes available to process that, or you don't regulate them well, or you, you can't build enough of them. So I think any, for me, any diet that is fairly reasonable is always an option. It always depends on the situation, who's using it, when, and it, it is something that you should try, do markers on, you know, test, and recognize if it did work for you, I believe it. For sure. But if it doesn't, you need to recognize that as well. Um, And you have to be careful with what you consider to be, um, you know, working or not. The, the, the literature is, I think in general um, overrepresented. So it's not as good as people say it is um, 
because of the limitations of entry level stuff, whenever you first start a new topic in science, it, it's always very speculative. You have small sample sizes. It's done in usually untrained people. Um, it's not done in high level athletes. It's usually not done in women. Usually the, the measures or the, or the markers are very entry level, but that's not a criticism. That's just the reality of it hasn't received extensive study until recently. So um, we have to re recognize what it is and what it isn't. Um, what it is not is a miracle cure that some sort of say it is. Um, but it is an option for some people, I think. And, and when people tell me, hey, I did it and uh, I, I got way better at this, um, I, I believe them. Um, but that doesn't mean that everyone should go on it. Yeah, I mean, like you're saying, it's a lot of inner individual differences. So you're going to be different than me. And really the only way without doing a whole nutrigenomic panel on yourself and figuring out what works is experimentation, right? You can maybe start with a hardcore ketogenic diet and maybe transition into something more like a modified Atkins diet or something like you're not, you have to think about like, you know, who has, uh, I guess, money involved in this too. A lot of protein bar companies and, and, you know, stuff like that. If you're just going on a straight protein diet and eating nothing but bars, probably not going to work out for you. Uh, you're going to have to eat some, you know, normal food as well, too. So it's totally in your individual. Well, that's actually, that's a really good point. Um, so one of the difficulties with interpreting the literature, Tom, is that no one can decide on what that diet actually is. Mm -hmm. um, and so Jimmy just brought up that. Now, traditionally, the original ketogenic diet was a very, very high fat, low protein, low carbohydrate. Well, that's been modified. And if you look at the literature, there are diets that are fairly high in protein that are still called in the, in the science, a ketogenic diet. And so you start to have a really tough time interpreting what's actually going on when people are using, you know, it's just like what paleo was five years ago. Yeah. You know, who the hell know what that meant when you said it? I don't know. It depends on whose book you read. Uh, so it just depends. You know, the scientists aren't even agreeing on what they're calling things, the ketogenic diet. So that makes a real challenge. Um, and there's also a difference between eating a ketogenic diet and actually being in a ketogenic state. Yeah, definitely. Which is, is very, very different too. So um, Marie Spano gave a fantastic talk about this and has a great thing on her website that um, she reviewed extensively the literature. And um, I think she presented a very fair uh, representation of what's going on and shows a lot of the limitations um, and shows, of course, the benefits of well. Again, I, th I think she did a, a very nice job. So I like her. Um, her breakdown of it um, there. Cool. So something I also wanted to touch on was the kind of the physiological side of mobility restrictions and flexibility, because I think lots of people just think it is short muscles in air quotes, um, but it's a lot more complicated from that um, than that. So I just wondered if you could touch on that. Um, let's go for Jimmy for this one. Um, can you repeat the question? Sorry, you're a little glitchy on there. Okay. So, um, Basically, lots of people think that um, mobility restriction is just short muscles, mm -hmm. um, but it's a lot more complicated from that um, than that. Sorry. So, what kind of things are we looking at that actually cause restrictions? Um, Andy, do you want to pick that up? I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, it's really, really tough when we look at human movement. Uh, it's so complex and multifaceted. It's virtually impossible for us to be able to tease out one thing is causing movement, one thing is not causing movement, or one thing is restricting movement. So uh, as an example, we've published several studies looking at foam rolling, right? Now, people will tend to say, and I, and I love this, it always makes me chuckle on the inside, and I, I generally don't say it, but when you hear people online or in a textbook or, you know, in person, they say things like, hey, you got to foam roll or roll on this thing because it does, and then you wait for their explanation of what it does physiologically, and I always laugh because I'm like, you're full of shit. <laughs> We have no idea that it breaks up scar tissue. We have no idea that it unwinds connective tissue. Now, I laugh usually in love because a lot of my friends um, are the ones saying it. But I'm only laughing because I'm like, man, like it's so impossible for impossible for us to actually tell what's going on. And it does um, it is a great example of a classic fallacy of logic. Uh, and this gets it's called the fallacy of fallacy. So this gets a bit complex, but it's going to make the point here. So the fallacy of the fallacy states that just because you prove or disprove the legitimacy of the explanation doesn't prove or disprove the legitimacy of the phenomenon itself. Okay. In this particular example, okay, say I, I am, 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 I'm coming up here and tell you like there's no physiological evidence that rolling a lot of cross ball unwinds tissue. 
because there isn't. Just because I can prove or disprove that doesn't actually mean that a lacrosse rolling on a lacrosse ball doesn't help you. Mm. I, I just can't explain why. And that's the best explanation I could say that. So, you know, when my friends, you know, you know Kelly and, and, and people like this say these things, I'm like, well, just because maybe their exact explanation isn't scientifically documented doesn't mean they're not right in what they're telling you to do. So I think that's an important thing is it would be almost impossible for us to actually verify what's happening because of the complex nature of muscle contraction. Um, you have to understand that you've got skeletal muscle, of course, like those cells we've been talking about. And around each individual fiber, it's wrapped with connective tissue. And then around each individual bundle of tissues or of fibers, those are all connected with, with connective tissue. And then around those go into a muscle and that's connected with connective tissue. And then we get packs of muscles that are connected with connective tissue. And that all comes together in one singular tendon. And that tendon attaches to the bone. And the only thing that makes you move or have give flexibility or mobility to you is how well or how tight that tendon is connected to the bone. And so we start talking about mobility or flexibility or any of these things we have to look at. It's coming from the entire system. And if you look at muscle in particular, you're probably not changing muscle length. I mean, maybe ever outside of some crazy stuff. Maybe could, Jimmy could tell you about hanging up uh, frog tissue from a load cell or something. And what's probably happening is if you gain flexibility, mobility, or range of motion is that you're getting something from the connective tissue, whether that be it's not changing, say, its resting state, or it's not changing its length, that it just changes its resting state. In other words, it, it relaxes, if, if you will. Or perhaps there is some change in its length, um, but that's probably very, very difficult to achieve. Uh, in fact, some muscle people will say that there is no improving the range of motion of muscle at all. It's all coming from the tendon. Yeah, the, the, really the only way you could change the length of the muscles if you were to chronically um, shorten or lengthen the muscle, as in like putting your arm in a cast. So if your arm's in a cast with your elbow bent for months, two, three months, your biceps are going to shorten. The actual muscles will shorten and your triceps will elongate. Um, not much will probably happen with the tendons in that case. But yeah, so if you really want to change the muscle length, that's the only way to do it. Uh, yeah, my point is you probably aren't getting that from holding a pose for 30 seconds. Right, right. You know, yeah. Twice a week. Like, that's not happening. There's some cool work done um, by a, a muscle guy in the past where he took, I think it was frog tissue, but it doesn't matter. He took a muscle cell and basically hangs it um, from a hook and he ties a heavy weight to the bottom of it and he just lets it hang for weeks at a time. And then he'll come back and he'll, he's able to measure, um, he's done this a lot of times, uh, a very clear increase in the amount of sarcomeres in the tissue. Okay. So the sarcomeres are the smallest contractile unit uh, of the tissue. And, and you have more of those when you do that. And so there is a physiological mechanism for that. But again, that's literally if it's hanging with a weight 24 hours a day for weeks at a time, it's an isolated muscle tissue. So that's a bit of a stretch from saying, yeah, did you get my pun there? Bit of a stretch. <laughs> Uh, it's a bit of a stretch from again saying like, yeah, I'm going to do this mobility for half an hour a day and that's going to change my actual muscle length. Yeah. A thing that people should also think about too is, you know, we were talking about muscle cells have all these nuclei, right? Well, muscle cells can change pretty quickly within, you know, 30 days or so you can change a lot in your muscles, but your tendons are acellular. So they are going to change over years maybe. And, you know, Andy, you had the tendon biopsy experience. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That looks like you're getting uh, flashbacks, like PTSD. Oh, <laughs> the worst, brother. I don't even know. Uh, I got a, a, a. I volunteered for a study um, to get a biopsy done in my patella tendon. So that's a tendon that crosses over your knee joint, the, the big one in the front. And what was weird about that one is it was a, like a micro biopsy. So the amount of tissue there they took was much, much smaller, less than a normal muscle biopsy, like Jimmy and I do. Um, the muscle biopsies are a little bit dis discomfortable. They're not discomfortable. Man, I'm all over the place today. Uh, uncomfortable. Um, but the patella biopsy wasn't. I mean, I almost felt nothing. And, and so I remember doing it and being like, this is awesome. I'll do 100 of these things. No problem. I couldn't squat down on my knee for probably two years. <laughs> I couldn't let my knee touch the ground. Like I couldn't wrestle off of that knee um i couldn't squat all the way to the bottom for probably two years from that and it just did not recover where you can do a biopsy of your quad and squat the next morning mm -hmm. 
Mm. So it speaks to Jimmy's point that it's just, um, in fact, one of the things that we looked at in that study was we were trying to compare what do the tendons look like in weightlifters, powerlifters, um, endurance athletes, and uh, untrained athletes. You see, or oh, untrained athletes, untrained people. Mm. You see there's major differences. Um, and nothing really shook out of the study, but uh, yeah, it's, it's some interesting stuff there. There are some people that focus on. Yeah, from a practical standpoint, it just shows that, I mean, you can grow and change your muscles pretty quickly, but that's why people have tendon injuries and things because these, these acellular collagen, you know, structures aren't going to change as fast. So you get super strong and then you could tear a tendon or, or a ligament or something like that. That's not going to heal as fast. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, something, the last kind of thing I really want to touch on in terms of like these questions, like honestly, it's, it's happened again, Andy, I've got a whole board of questions. <laughs> and I'm about four of them. Um, so um, I wanted to ask about the study you did uh, called Metabolic Demands of Heavy Metal Drumming and kind of <laughs> where, where that came from, because not only being the best title to a study I've seen ever, um, there's, a, there's a pretty cool story as well. Yeah, uh, that was actually really cool, man. This is why uh, I try to not take science too seriously. <laughs> you know, um, this is a great example of, of how I had a grad, grad student, Brian Romero, uh, just a really cool guy. He was a professional uh, uh, musician. I think he was a drummer, but I don't, I'm not even sure. But he basically came up um, and was like, hey, I want to do a thesis project. And basically, here's my interest area. And I'm like, well, that's not science. We can't do that. <laughs> we can't put an entire drum set in our exercise physiology lab and mention that. But why not? <laughs> well, it turns out we did. <laughs> so it was really cool. He got He found professional drummers. Um, to come in and we did this like which is actually super funny because we did it Saturday mornings um, because you know like they're, they're gonna come in and they did something like a 45 minute drum set that's like six <laughs> songs I think and they're we want them to bang away you know like we want what we what we're trying to do is capture the metabolic demands of heavy metal drum in other words like it, is it a good workout is it a decent uh, exercise workout to you know, to do this and so we, we wanted them to actually bang away like they're really doing it so they brought in their own drum sets <laughs> they did three songs that we depicted at a set um, cadence and then I let them play three songs of their own length and it ended up being like 45 minutes and then we had them wearing um, metabolic masks the entire time so we could collect ventilation um, which actually ended up being pretty cool because uh, you know it ends up being a pretty decent workout they burned quite a few calories yeah, I bet and it was, <laughs> this is another example of like, man, all of the logistic stories I could tell you with this one are just like, just hilarious. That, <laughs> that go on behind the scenes, things like we had to try to account for drug use and alcohol use. <laughs> 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 well, we're specifically targeting professional heavy metal drummers. <laughs> well, we're like, oh yeah, you got to come in Saturday morning to do this. And they're like, I got to do what at what time? <laughs> yeah. and so we had to like normally in a study we'll say like no alcohol or caffeine 48 hours out or, or whatever you know or normal caffeine use no alcohol and for this particular study we, we had to tell them like maintain your normal friday night friday night alcohol and drug use <laughs> so, so then you come in under the same circumstances at the time which was funny and uh yeah, I got a lot of phone calls and emails on Saturdays being like, what the hell is going on in the lab? <laughs> yeah, they're doing it right. That's okay. That's awesome. Yeah, so, so we published it in a kind of a little low journal there. Um, they got it out. It's fun. It's interesting. Um, you know, I can tell you this too, that I don't know if you've, if you've heard, uh, uh, I actually probably haven't, um, you know, a mutual friend of ours, Chris Moore. I think he's was one of your first, one of your first uh, guests. Yeah, I think he's about 24, episode 24, something like that. Yeah, so, you know, Chris is a near, dear friend of mine. Um, well, we lived together uh, from eight years ago or something now, 10 years ago maybe. And uh, Chris was 370 pounds and going up at the time that we lived together. He was getting ready for uh, trying to break a world record in powerlifting. And I was about 150 pounds uh, and I was going down and I was getting ready for national championships uh, in, in Olympic weightlifting. So it's funny, and you know, we were constantly in this battle in our house of, you know, he wanted every fan on in the house, and I wanted every fan off, and you know, he's hypercaloric and sweating, doing everything because he's almost four hundred pounds, and I'm just cold all the time and, and under eating, all this stuff. Well, uh, like he got he got super into rock band. You remember that old video game? Yeah, yeah, that's great. So, so he was like, he was always banging away at this drum set with 
so funny because he took it so seriously. He's just crushing away and going. He got all the way up to like expert level and and he would just go nuts and he would just be dripping in sweat. And one day I came into the house and I I don't remember I came home early for something. Uh, unexpectedly I got off earlier or something like that. And so he didn't think I was coming home yet. And I walk in the door and I open the door and he's in the middle of the living room and he had built himself like a custom mic stand. To hold, nice. to hold up the mic he's crushing away he is blasting singing to like his heart's content he's covered in sweat <laughs> and, I, and i open the door and he sees me and he looks at me and he's like like that look in his eyes that i just got home early and i caught him doing something else you know <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's like he just tails off in his song and just like puts the microphone away oh, no. down and just leaves it goes into oh, his bedroom no. yeah, so, awesome. uh, it always I always remember that story when, when we did this drumming study. I'm like, man, I wish I could have, I wish I could have sent Chris's paper. I um, yeah. loved it because I know for sure that it is a metabolic cost to drumming heavy metal if you get after. It. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was his cardio. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, so the last kind of things I'd like to touch on are um, any daily routines you follow, whether that's health, whether that's mindset, whether it's anything like that. Um, so, Jimmy, do you want to go first? Yeah, I've actually been trying to you know, get a, actually a routine going. I think that having a routine in general, at least during the work week or whatever, is really important. Um, the summers have been a little off, but I typically get up, you know, around six or six 30 coffee is the first thing I can't go without my four shots of espresso. Uh, so that's impressive. Four shots. Uh, that's what I go for in the morning and then try to get some writing and stuff done usually before I do emails. So I try to get, you know, 30 or 40 minutes in in the morning of ideas, writing, and then just planning my day and then going from there. But yeah, I've got a few things I'm trying to work on, but usually that's it. Just getting the day started off right. Mm. I'm, a, I'm a little different. Uh, I get up uh, probably uh, most of the time before five. Um, in the early fours is, is my preference. I don't get to do that as much anymore uh, this because of schedule wise, but uh, probably the latest 515 um, that I'm up and out. And, and I'll usually come in and I like to, uh, to get things off my plate immediately. Like, uh, and that, what that usually means is students emailed me a question about lab experiments we're running the night before and they need to know the answer now um, mm. because that stuff doesn't wait. Chemistry doesn't wait. Mm -hmm. So it's usually like, hey, if they don't make the right decision right now, the whole experiment can be ruined. Uh, and so I try to get on that immediately because I have students that are running stuff overnight. They're working one on the sleeve. And so I want to make sure that there's no catastrophe or nothing but out. So I'll do that very quickly. But uh, I'm actually, um, this is where I will differ from your probably normal crowd, Tom, considerably. I am staunchly opposed to uh, extensive routine. Okay. Um, I am in routine in terms of like, I like to go to bed about the same time and wake up at the same time. But there's nothing in my life that, and I've tried to do this in one purpose, that I absolutely have to do to make my day work well. Or there's one thing that I can't get away with not doing. Um, I actually think that's a major limitation, um, both, I would say, uh, uh, ph philosophically, I believe that, and physiologically. Mm. Uh, now, I mean, I'll drink coffee like the rest of us. Uh, but honestly, sometimes I forget. Uh, or I'll drink like two drinks and then leave it or no way. I can't forget. <laughs> 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 um, but I, I don't think that, um, as I mentioned earlier, a variety, I think is physiologically very important. Now variety needs to come with some stability. Uh, and so what I don't mean is like, you shouldn't wake up at 7am one day and then noon the next day and then 3am, like that's going to be a train wreck. Yep. I do once in a while, you should get really, really, really thirsty. Um, you should get overheated. You should do something that's too heavy once in a while. And by once in a while, maybe once a month. Um, yeah. You should probably not eat for 20 hours or 24 hours once in a while. Um, get tremendously uh, exhausted. Stay up all night or something like that. Um, or sleep extra. Sleep for 15 hours in a day. Um, so to me, that's, it's really important to do that. And so I like to have my waking and bedtime fairly simple or fairly standardized. Uh, but the rest of my day, like there's nothing like I have to meditate today. I have to journal. Um, I don't, I don't ever like to be in a situation where I feel like the first three hours of my day is, is set because I have all these damn things I have to do. That's interesting. Um, you know, like Jimmy is, is probably similar to me. Like sometimes I wake up with my alarm or before my alarm and I'm like, I'm so invigorated. I'm so damn excited for my day and I'm, I'm so clear headed. I don't want to go dick around with meditating for half an hour. I'm like, I, I want to do this now before this idea gets out or and I'm so excited. Cool. This. 
uh, that I just crush. And I want the space to be able to be like, you know what, if I wake up really clear headed, um, which happens a lot for me or really excited, I don't want to put that energy away just because I've decided I'm going to arbitrarily make sure I do 30 minutes of stretching in the morning or something. Yeah. I'll, I'll do it later. Um, let me go crush. Um, I like that. I like the idea about um, getting comfortable being uncomfortable as well. Uh, I think that kind of lends itself to the kind of stoic philosophy as well. I think that's, that's, that's really cool. Um, yeah. You know, like, like a Chris Moore would always say is like, you know, with training, ride the wave. So if, if the surf's good, man, go surf. If it's not, then don't. And you know, neither one of us surf, but his point was, if if you wake up or if you go to the gym and like you're on like go ahead and go a little bit more exactly um, but then recognize when when it's not there it's not there and at that point then maybe i'll do some strategies to maybe reinvigorate the juices or something but um and if it's there i'm not gonna i'm not gonna do something because i've set some sort of stupid schedule to go journal or, or something like that so I, I try to not have things like that in my life and in real life, if the surf is good, you do have to go because I do <laughs> surf and I will miss class if the surf is good <laughs> from all uh, routine. I think that's fair enough. And then yeah. if we can just squeeze in one more, um, what, um, who's the first person you think of when you hear the word successful? That's really hard. I mean, success is so subjective. Yeah, I can, exactly. If I can say one thing, uh, I'll tell you Dr. Andy Galpin. When I think ah, of, uh, <laughs> the bromance is strong. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm going to go out you here with, um, I'm going to say my neighbor Gus. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, so I, I don't know anything much more about Gus other than his name is Gus. And he's, he's not really my neighbor, but he is my, uh, he's my, um, my dog's, my dog's best friend's dad. So we take my puppy to the to this little park around the corner in the morning and him and his puppy, they just like wrestle WWF style as hard as they possibly can for like three minutes. And then they're exhausted and they lay there and they die and they're good for the day. Um, but the guy's crazy because, you know, he, he's usually up super early in the morning, but he's, he's so happy all the time and he's so mentally relaxed. And all I know is that he's a consultant uh, for like engineering of some sort. Uh, and he's got a nice house in Orange County. Not super nice. Um, I think appears to be doing well financially, well-ish. Um, but the reason why I say he's successful is he, he just never seems like he's flustered by anything. He's, yeah. he, I see him all the time on like at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, like on his lawn, in a, in a lawn chair, just like talking to the neighborhood people. He's got, a, he's got a couple of kids, and he's always taking them to practice and stuff. So it doesn't look like he's – he, to me, he seems like he's found a very good balance between his income and his livelihood and the things he likes to do. He spends every Saturday in the dog park, hanging out with other dogs, doing things for other people. He's always watching other people's stuff. And I'm like, man, how do you, he's not old. He's not mm -hmm. retired. He's super young. And I'm like, how did you, how do you balance a, a job like consulting for engineering firms, which has got to take a lot of horsepower and a lot of time. And the problem with that is you only make money when you work. Mm. So he's, he's not drawing salary. So how do you balance that? Yeah, that's cool. Work and stuff. So to me, I'm like, dude, you're just, you're super happy. You sounds like you've, you know, I, don't, I don't know what's going on behind scenes. You're content depressed. with where you're at, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. I've, um, I've got someone like exactly like that, who, who was actually a guest in my podcast. He's one of my old personal training clients, him and his wife. He used to nice. train. And um, yeah, they've just got it now. It's like a guy called Chris Fisher. Like he's just, he, was, he said to me, the last thing I, because he lives in New Zealand now, the last thing I, he said to me face to face was, you can't change what happens to you, only how you react to it. And it's like, oh, that's one of those things that I should remember. Like that's, <laughs> that's that, those moments. Um, so yeah, that's something that always sticks in my head. And guys, I'm really sorry. I'd love to carry on this chat for, for hours, um, but I have to shoot now. So thank you so much for jumping on the show. Yeah, thanks for having us. No always worries. a blast, man. Keep rolling. You're doing great. Cheers, man. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Alpha Movement Podcast. Remember, you can head over to alphamovement.co slash muscle to download your free cheat sheet detailing the three mechanisms behind muscle growth and exactly how to use them to get maximum impact. Also, head over to facebook.com slash alphamovementofficial or head over to alphamovement.co um, to find out more about the Alpha Movement or subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher or wherever you listen to your podcast. And whilst you're there, don't forget to leave a five-star review. Alternatively, you can find me, Tom Foxley, mostly on Facebook because that's where I spend most of my social media time. Ciao.